I feel like I'm going to have to run through this. I got lots of material, so it's going to take some time. I pray this literally sinks into your heart and that you're really, really blessed by it. But we're going to preach. We're going to meddle. We're going to pastor a little bit. Going to do a bunch of stuff today. Are you excited? I got how much? Wow, praise Jesus. All right, Cheryl started the clock already. Okay, First John, what a summer. I've so enjoyed this, First John. I mean, First John was always one of my favorite books. I can remember when I was, uh, before I was married, just really came back on fire for Jesus. I was reading First John with a friend of mine. We'd meet every Saturday morning. We'd pray together, and I was reading First John, and, and I said, I feel so close to God. I'm never going to sin again, and I remember saying that, too, and I was like, I'm just never going to sin ever again, you know, because it says those who are born of God, they don't sin, so I figured, I've made it. And uh, only about twice since then have I actually had a bad moment. But, uh, but pretty good I got over it. Was that one right there? Oops, there's another one. Oops, maybe it's more than twice. Sorry about that. All right, let's look. The Bible. The Bible was not written to you, but it's written for you. That means it didn't have your address on it. It didn't come in the mail, dear Carl. All right, so it wasn't written to you specifically. Therefore, you got to read it through a context, through a setting, through an understanding. You got to know the who, what, why, when, and where's of it because it is a real book. It's an inspired, beautiful, holy document, but it is letters, specific letters written to people with purposes. And so you got to understand that. Do you get me? If you don't do that, you can take stuff miserably out of context and get into really weird things like uh, women have to come to church and always wear a head covering and all that stuff. And Pastor Cheryl was in a church in Jamaica and they separated us. I went one place, she went to another. And the church she went to before they came out on the platform, the, the pastor said, can you take out your nose ring and put your doily on your head because women need a covering? And Cheryl said, no, I can't. <laughs> Cheryl just said, I'm actually free. And that's pretty good. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. It was kind of weird because we were with the pastor's father the day before and he didn't seem to have a problem with the nose ring tattoos and everything else. But uh, anyway, uh, that was kind of strange. But, but they get that from taking a letter that they think was written to them and in their time and they're taking totally out of context the portion of the scripture and trying to apply it today, which is just wrong. Or all you women would be in sin who are not wearing a hat right now. Just check your head. Yes, you. Oh, my goodness. So you can get into a lot of problems if you don't understand and interpret the Bible properly. And John's one of those books that you got to understand why did John write it, who was it. I love this book because this is John who was a teenager, you know, when Jesus called him. He was considered probably the youngest of the apostles, youngest of the disciples. And he was somebody who, who in his own words said, Jesus loved me, literally more than anybody, more than this all group that were really tight with him. I'm the one he loved. And here's someone had a really intimate, tight relationship with God at a very young age, traveled with him, experienced physically and personally up close, put his head physically on the breast of Jesus. When they ate, John was right there reclining on Jesus. This guy suddenly now, boom, he's been through life, been through a lot of experiences, seen Jesus come, ascend and go, and now he's seen the church grow, be established and, and start to fill the known earth. And now as a man, 95 or even older, he is writing this book. And they said when he was older, they would carry him into the meetings and he'd reach out his hands on both sides and say, little children children love one another. Little children love one another. Little children love one another. And you know, I love that when you find somebody senior in ministry and been around for a while, you know, they've really filtered through all the nonsense of life and they come down to what's really important. You know what's really important? Little children love one another. That's what's really important. And John was writing this book because in leading and pastoring the church, he saw some lies, some deceptions, some corrupting influences coming into the church and trying to lead the people astray. And so he wanted to make sure that they would know. And the word know is used so much through 1 John. He says, I want you to know. I want you to know. I want you to be established. I want you to be assured. I want you to be confident in who you are in Christ. Fantastic book. But there's some stuff that you look at and it could make you concerned because you know, it says, you know, if you're not walking in the light, you're walking in darkness, you got no fellowship with God, and then you can get all concerned, going, well, I, I don't know if I, I might have walked in darkness once. I, what do you mean by that? And, you know, what scale of light? What scale? So there's some things, if you don't understand it, interpret it properly, you can get confused. But I think through the summer, everybody did a good job of making that straight. How about you? Good stuff. So it's a personal letter by John, the Apostle John, amazing book. Now, uh, Zach said, this is not a prescription for Christian living. This is a description of what happens when you get placed in Christ. All right, fantastic. I'm just going to do something here. 
Can you have all that stuff? Sorry about that. I'm making a mess. Oops. Oops. I'm making a mess. I'm doing something. Okay. I got something in here. And I know what it is and you don't. But I want to describe to you what it is. All right. It's something that contains things that uh, you would take before you would do prayer and altar ministry. They are a, ty- a kind of mint. They are not altoids. They are XL. They are not just XL. They are. They are not spearmint. They are peppermint. Yes, that's what they are. Sorry about that. I made all that mess just to do that. Now, you see, that was a description of something that was inside a container. Now, this is not a prescription for Christian living, meaning that this is not how you have to live to be accepted by God. You have to live like this or God will reject you. You have to live like this or you need to be concerned that you're even a believer. It's a description of what it is to be a believer. So I gave you a description of what was in the box. I'm describing it to you. So John is describing, and and these descriptions, if you say, oh, thank God it's not a prescription because I'm having a hard time loving everybody. Thank God it's not a prescription because you know what? I don't mind sinning just a little bit once in a while. Because, you know, it says those who sin, you're not of God. Those who don't love others, then you can't say you love God. So even though it is a description and not a prescription, don't think you're off the hook because it's a prescription. Because what he's saying is because you are in a vital, abiding, intimate relationship with God, you should not sin. Say amen. Amen. And because you're in a vital moment by moment, intimate relationship with a God who and you have a living, working revelation of how much he loves you, you should absolutely, without condition, love every single person. Wow, that was really weak. You know, so this really is a description. You know, being a believer looks like something. It doesn't look like just everybody else in the world. There really should be those who walk in light and those who don't know any better. And those who say, I have an intimate abiding fellowship with God. He is my Lord and Savior. He's baptized me with his love. Should absolutely, without condition, accept everyone else. So we've been backing up a bit all summer long. Don't want to lay any heavies on you. Just want to take it easy. But the truth is, John was saying... Guys, you got to love one another. Guys, you've got to pursue righteousness. Guys, you got to manifest the power of the life, the anointing that is in you. Let it out. Let the full work of salvation that you have inherited, let it come into manifestation. Be the light of the world that you are. But it means he does want to see it come into expression and into manifestation. Can I get an amen just from the back row, front row, middle row, side row? Amen. All right. Thank you very much. So, so Paul, John, sorry, John is calling for a quality of life that is the result of an abiding relationship, not the reward for rigid disciplines. He's calling for the quality of life that is the result of an abiding relationship and not the reward for rigid personal disciplines. Religion says do these personal disciplines and you'll get these benefits from God. That's not true. Every single thing from God is free. It's a free gift, every single bit of it. And every single thing, he is not holding back on you at all. He wants to lavish you with every good thing as a child of God. It's yours. That's absolutely true. So if people who teach that this rigid discipline will, you know, cause God to pour this on you, no. But disciplines do bring into manifestation what God has already done in your life. But you know what? It's God who brings the discipline. It's walking in the spirit that brings the discipline. It's not my fleshly human effort that's going to cause God to come into manifestation in my life. Amen. Go ahead. Shout amen. Turn to your neighbor and say high five. Knuckle sandwich. Whoa. Okay. That was good. Three people got into that. That Awesome. All right. So these are not conditions or tests to determine if you're a child of God. You know, this was right at the start. He who hates his brother is in darkness. He who hates his brother is in darkness. So don't hate your brother. I hate him. A believer shouldn't do that. But you know what? Believers can successfully do that and still be a believer. 
It's true. You can have people who are children of God, born of God, and still act like they're not. But you know what? You shouldn't. Turn to your neighbor and say, you shouldn't. You just shouldn't. Because somewhere inside, when you're saying that, the Holy Spirit should say, I can't believe you said that. What? I did. I just said it. I hate them. Well, why would you say that? Well, I do. Well, you got to back up on that. Like, if, if you're saying that, and suddenly the spirit who was in you is not having a conversation with you, saying, put the brakes on that right now. You should be having those conversations with God when you say something that is contrary to his nature in your life. Amen. Thank you, pastor. He who sins is of the devil. <laughs> That's right here in the book we were studying. Right? 314, who does not love his brother abides in death. Wow. I mean, these are, but these are not prescriptions, but they are descriptions of the people of God. So when we are not manifesting the nature, that new nature that we have been baptized in, everything old is gone, everything has become new. When we're not, and you can successfully do it, when we're not manifesting it, you should be having this inside voice going beep, 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 not manifesting God. Danger, danger. All right, so these are calls to express your fellowship with God. All right, 1 John 3, 23, he said, and this is his commandment that we should believe on his name and believe on his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And he gave us this commandment. When he talked about the commandments in the book of John, he wasn't talking about the ones written on, you know, blocks of stone. He was talking about the new covenant, the new commandments that Jesus gave. So he wasn't saying honor the old covenant because the old covenant has been fulfilled. And literally the new covenant says the old covenant was abolished as commandments for us to live by. The new commandments are are that we're to believe in the Lord and we're to love one another as he has loved us. We've got those new commandments. So this is not done in our own power and this is not done through behavior modification. This is fruit produced by the Spirit and it does not command our performance. It is fruit that is produced by the Spirit and it does not command our performance. Amen, right? So it's awesome. You can go down the fields. You see the corn coming up and you see fruit and different things coming up and different things manifesting in this season of harvest. And it's so awesome going by the cornfields. You can put down the window of your car now and you can hear the crops just going, corn, corn. They're not, they're not striving to manifest corn. It's a natural result of what's in the seed. It's in their DNA. It's, in, it's already written in the seed that when that seed dies and it comes into expression, that corn is going to take place. And the corn crops just had to go, corn's coming. Woo, here, ooh, here comes the corn. Ooh, look, there's some corn. Woo, hey, look at the full growth. I mean, they're just enjoying the ride because it's a natural progression of abiding in their DNA and in the soil and in their placement. So that's like us. We're in Christ. The seed of Christ, the imperishable, incorruptible seed of Christ is in us, and it is naturally going to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to happen. It's going to happen just naturally, and God's going to do it, and it is a work of the Spirit of God, how that comes into manifestation. Now, John 15, 1 to 6, read a part of that. It says, I am the vine, my Father is the vine dresser. I am the vine. So Jesus is the vine, the Father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me, say in me. Every branch in me does that does not bear fruit, he takes it away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out. Now, listen to this really carefully. This is John, the same John who wrote this gospel is the one who wrote the letter we're studying. So it's all about abiding in him. So how do we manifest the nature of God? I'm the vine, so you're in him. So say in me. So if you're in him, how many are in him? Look at the bottom verse in blue where it says, not in me, not. So there's two types of people, those that are in the vine and those that are not in the vine. Now, if you're in the vine and you don't bear fruit, he takes you away and throws you into the fiery furnace. You're cut off for all eternity. Death, death, death. That's a sad translation right there because that word takes away is just a brutal translation. should never be there because it does not mean takes away. It means those who are not bearing fruit, he lifts up. Say lifts up. 
If you're a believer and you're in him, he's not going to cut you off because you're in him. You didn't put yourself in him. He put you in him and he put you in him and he's never going to fail you. So if you're not manifesting what you're supposed to manifest as a child of God, he's not going to cut you off. He's not going to deny himself. He's not going to be unfaithful to himself. He won't chop off himself. You are in him. So what he's going to do is say, you're not bearing fruit. You're stuck in the mud. You're manifesting flesh and nature that's altogether ugly. I am going to pick you up. And that's what he does. But you see, the branches that get cast out are the ones that were never, ever attached. But if you're in him, you're going to manifest fruit, and he's committed that you'll manifest fruit. Even if you've been manifesting some fruit, he's going to prune you so that you can manifest more fruit. Say, bring on the pruning father. (laughs) Well, you're in for trouble. Okay. (laughs) But we got to know that John is absolutely wants you to be confident, wants you to know that you are in him, and you're never going to be cast away. Now, here's that word, takes away. The word takes away is a, word, is a Greek word, aero, and it is to raise up, to elevate, to lift up, to raise from the ground, to take up and raise towards, to elevate, to take oneself, and to carry what has been raised up. So it should say, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts from the dirt. He elevates so that it can get into the face of the sun. So that's what it should say. And a lot of people get all condemned when they say, I don't know, I could get cut off. I'm not a very good believer. There is such a thing as not a very good believer, but he will never, ever deny a not very good believer. He will never, ever cut you off, but he will walk with you. He'll be absolutely committed to you. His spirit is going to work with you because he is committed that everything, all of heaven, every deposit, everything necessary for the life and godliness, he's already given you, and he's going to help you bring all of that into manifestation. And he'll never, ever, ever, ever quit on you. And because he loves us that much, we should never, ever, 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 ever quit on anybody else. That's the nature of children of God. Say, that's good, pastor. Here it is, the same word, Mark 2, 11. It says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So that's the word, take up. So I don't know why the interpreters tra- use the word as cut off, because it never should have been that. It should always be take up. When you made a decision to accept him, you abide in him, you are, in a fruit- you are fruitful. He will make you more fruitful. If you're fruitless, he will lift you up, and he will make you fruitful. So God is absolutely, totally committed to you. Here's a picture Look at that. There's a vine, you see? And if you go out to a vineyard, you go anywhere around here and look at a vineyard, you'll see the same thing. So imagine if one of those vines fell down. What would the guy do? He'd go through his vineyard, and if he saw one that fell down, he would pick it up and tie it up so it can be fruitful. And God will never, ever fail you, and he'll never let you fail. So he's committed to you being fruitful. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so there was a fellow on the airplane. The airplane was going down. They all got handled parachutes, and he jumped out the window. Everybody else, pop, parachutes went up, pop, parachutes went up. He went, pop, no parachute. So he's fallen 7.62 meters per second squared, I think it is. Gravity, I think it's that. Is that it? Amazing, those facts stick in your head. Straight down, he's like free falling, and then he says, you know, I can just wait till I hit the ground, or... Uh, I can try to fix this thing. So he meddles around, turns around, and he's trying to fix it. He's, he's trying to figure out how can I get this thing to release properly. So he's falling. He's saying, wow, what, what's going on? He gets to about 5,000 feet, and all of a sudden, he can see a guy coming up. And this guy goes flying past him. And on the way by, he goes, you know anything about parachutes? And he said, no. You know anything about gas stoves? <laughs> I don't know what happened after that. That's where the story ended, so... You'll have to research that for yourself. But I just said that'd be funny. You know, knowing stuff is really, really important. And John really wants you to know some stuff. So we're going to go through the last of the, of the book, 13 all the way to 21. We're going to take it verse by verse. Are you ready? Verse by verse, we're going to finish up the book of John. So we're going to start 1 John 5.13. So go to 1 John 5.13. Take a look. Here's what it says. These things I have written to you who believe. So who's John writing to? He's writing to believers. He says, I've written these things to believers, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. I think it's over 30 times he used a word or a derivative of no in this small little epistle. No, he wants you to know. I wrote this so that you may know that you have eternal life. 
I want you to know that. I wrote this whole thing because I want you to not know how to get it. I want you to know you got it. You got it. I want you absolutely assured that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So six things we're going to go through in like 20 minutes. Somehow it's going to happen. Six things that we, he wants us to know. He wants us to be assured of. Are you ready? Number one, I want you to know that you have eternal life. I want you to know that you have eternal life and not that you're going to go to heaven someday or not that your life will be everlasting. But I want you to know that right now you have a father that loves you and you right now are in a living, abiding relationship that is eternal, that is free, that is full of the life of God right now. And I want you to know it. You're not hanging at the bus stop until you get out of this mess. God has placed himself in you. He's visited you and you are in an intimate relationship with your loving heavenly father right now. And I want you to know that. You're, you're not waiting for something great to happen. You are a great thing waiting to happen because Almighty God has fixed his abode in you. He loves you and he'll never fail you. And you've got that when? You've got that right now and forever. Whoa! I want you to know that. You know, not just in the sweet by and by, not just, you know, a life that's long, but a life that's awesome and a life that's full of God right now, intimate with God right now. And in the verses previous to that, God said, and who says? Who, who is it who stands and assures you of this? Who is it? I mean, men come and they testify and they, they give evidence of things. Well, who is the one who's going to testify? Who is the one who will assure you that this is a reality for you? Who is it? Who? It's me. It's God himself himself who says you are my child and I have brought you into a relationship with me and it is everlasting life wow so if you don't think you've got it you are arguing with God himself the king of the universe says you're my child you have everlasting life forever I am with you now and always giving you the fullness of who I am who says so? I say so. God Almighty says so. And you know what? There's nothing bigger in the whole universe that could assure you of that fact. <laughs> was that, was it really that impressive, Terry? Was, was it impressive? You're easily impressed, but, but, I, but I appreciate you. All right, we're going to move on to number two. How fast was that? All right, First John 5, 14 and 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Oh, hey, honey. I'm so glad that you hear me. Because, you know, most times when I call, you got the phone on silent, and I can never get a hold of you. <laughs> and honest to God, I think yesterday I left five messages on your phone, and you never called me back. I don't know. We should just give the phone back. You never. Did you just cut me off? <laughs> Honestly, we, we, all of us, our whole family is like, I don't know why mom has a phone. It's impossible to get a hold of her. And then she, if we don't answer, she loses it. I'm just, I'm just let us confess our sins one for another. <laughs> but I just, I, well, let me tell you something. Unlike Pastor Cheryl, God always answers. I mean, all of the answers. He's always there. And this is the confidence that we have that, you know, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears us and we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have. We, if we ask it, we know we have the petition. I mean, before you even get it, you can know you have it because he is the God who hears and answers prayer. Amen? So we know that. So this is important stuff right there. So he wants us to know that your prayers get answered. So prayer is not telling God stuff that he doesn't know. I used to think that's what prayer was. God, did you know I'm having a bad day down here? Like, holy moly, you're just even watch? What are you doing? Like, kick in. Like, I got scriptures that I could throw in your face right now, you know? It says, you know, you'll never see me fall, my foot against a stone. I stubbed my toe the other day in the coffee table. Like, where were you? 
I was quoting Psalm 91 and, you know, boom. He said I wouldn't stub my foot against it. I used to think praying was telling God stuff that he didn't know or he forgot or, you know, filling him in or, or you know, I had to tell him and that, you know, there's some stuff I need and stuff, but it's not. It's not telling God stuff he doesn't know or getting him to do what he doesn't want to do. Some people think if you pray hard enough, you can twist God's arm and he's reluctant really to heal you. But if you just pray hard enough and do, you know, the 43 steps to the 25 house, you can squeeze a healing out of him. Oh, let's pray. Oh God, please, please. You know, and this is a mess. It's messed up because it says, I want you to know, John says, I want you to know that when you pray, he hears you. And I want you to know that when you're praying anything that's in alignment with him and alignment with his will, you have what you've asked for. How many think that's good news? All right, so prayer is not telling God stuff that he doesn't know or trying to convince him to do stuff he doesn't want to do. Prayer is confidence that he hears. And secondly, prayer is a conversation. It's receiving his will and gaining his understanding in situations. So prayer is where you're just having a conversation with God. You can approach him in a really bad mood. You really can. You can, you can come boldly in a bad attitude. You know, and, but God's like, well, what's up? What, what's, what are you? You got your you know, knickers all in the knot over What? And you can have conversations with him. And he wants you to come to him. He wants you to talk to him. And he wants you to gain understanding about what's going on in your life. And he wants to work with you. He wants to help you. So there it is. It's confidence and it's a conversation. Or it's partnership. It's partnering with God because you're going to have conversations. You're going to hear what his heart and what his mind is. And then you're going to get into a partnership with what he wants to manifest on the earth. Say amen. Yeah. All right. Good, good, good. So listen then. So four ways that God answers prayer. You ready? This is simple stuff. Stuff I use, and when I teach on prayer, here it is. You ready? And I like stuff that's simple. So here it is. Four ways God's answers prayer. You ready? Number one, no. Sometimes the answer is no, so just stop it. I came, I was pastoring, and I had a lady came to me and says, have you done any weddings yet? I said, you know, I just started pastoring. I haven't done any weddings. You're going to do my wedding this summer. I said, wow, that's great. Who are you marrying? I'm marrying that man over there. I went, I'm pretty sure he's married to that woman over there. I know, but God's going to give him to me. And I went, well, you know what God says? No. <laughs> oh, yeah, he told me. I said, that's the wrong fella you're listening to because God's not going to do that. No? Are you sure? No? She left the church. Anyways, that was okay. <laughs> you know? You know, like, I see that person over there. They're, they're, they're struggling. It looks like they got a lot of back pain and in a walker. And Lord, do you think it'd be okay if I went over and prayed with them? You know what the answer to that one is? Go. Because it says, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. It says, go, lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. You've already got an answer for that one. It's go, go, amen, amen, go. Cheryl asked me if I felt like dating her. I said, Lord, what do you think? He said, go. <laughs> I don't know if he said go, but I said go. So anyways, that was a... <laughs> but there's sometimes, you know, that you be praying to God, asking him for stuff, and sometimes his answer is grow. You're, you're right on the right path. You're absolutely right. And I just want you to grow into this. And there's some things that are going to unfold in your life. And you know what? You, you want wrong F, and you're absolutely right. That's your destiny. But you're only able to handle B right now. So, so let's get C, D, E, and you're going to get to F. But let's take it one step at a time, Carl. Let's grow into that right now. And I want you to grow into that. And then there's other times where, you know, God speaks a word over you. And then you say, Lord, I want it now. And he says, slow. Or wait. I don't want to wait. Wait. Remember all those who through faith and patience endured and received the promise. I don't often like when he says slow. I've had prophetic words over my life that, that I've not seen manifest yet, not even close. And there's times I go like, what is your problem? He said, slow. Oh, come on, he said, grow. Your patience when it comes to full maturity. If I wanted patience, I'd have been a dentist. There you go. Still slow. <sighs> but anyway, that's my simple thing to pray. You don't pray to change his will. You pray to engage his will. You pray to engage his will. When you engage his will and you know you're asking according to his will, what happens? You get the petition that you've asked for. So prayer is just a beautiful dynamic relationship with God. Can I get it? Amen. John 14, 14, same guy, John, he wrote in his gospel. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. In my name. In my name, according to who he is, and you know, in reference to him in his name, asking things that promote God's glory and the good of others. 
asking things that promote God's glory and the good of others. How can you know that you're praying the will of God? How can you know that you're asking right? How can you know? Uh, four little things, four simple things. You could give you 15. I could give you a lot more. But here's four just to help you. Ready? I'm praying about something. How do I know I'm praying right, Pastor? Check it out in the scripture. Well, I want to know. I broke a leg. I want to know if God wants to heal my leg. Well, I see in the scripture that he doesn't want any of your bones broken. He wants to touch your bones, heal your bones. So, yeah, I think that's good. See, my son had a, a bone condition in his hip. And when I heard that, I said, that's horrible. That's not God's will for us. He says, says, none of our bones will experience that. So we took those scriptures about bones and we prayed them because we knew what God wanted about that. You know, if you don't know what to do and it's not found in the Bible, you want to know if you should marry Pastor Cheryl. Well, that would be no because I'm already married to her. That was simple. But, you know, when I was younger, if I was like, man, should I marry Cheryl? I don't know. There was times where my mom, my mom was pretty easy. My mom said, you and Cheryl were destined a long, long time ago. I knew it. You're done. You're in for it. She is God's glorious gift to you. She knew that. And there were people around me who said, don't be afraid, Carl. Man, I'm telling you, this is God's plan for your life. And I wish they were around now because I'd like to talk to them. (laughs) And tell them thank you because you are absolutely right you know and and, and you know what god's will isn't so narrow that you're like oh stay on the edge i'm in the will of god oops i'm in the will of god his will is a lot more flexible than that it's okay all right if cheryl would have said no god would have found me a better woman so it's okay (laughs) was that awkward right there not that he could ever find a better woman because cheryl's perfect Did I recover a little bit there? Not so much. Can we run this back, Sue, on the recording? Can you edit edit it later? Because that was kind of silly. So. Okay, I hate doing that. Then there's the voice of the Spirit. You know, you might not find it in the Scripture, and everybody's praying with you, but they don't know. There's times, you know what? The Spirit will lead you. The voice of the Spirit in you. It says, the Spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord, and he lights your inward parts. So the Holy Spirit himself, he says, will guide you into all truth. He will even tell you things that are yet to come. So you've got the voice of the Spirit in your life. And then there's one where you might say, well, I think I'm going to go this way. And then all of a sudden, you feel this grinding on the inside of you. You're trying to get moved towards it. <laughs> You can't sleep, and oh, I'm persevering. Hallelujah, glory to God. I'm gonna, you know, sometimes there's no peace on that. It says, "Let the peace of God guard your heart. Let the peace of God." Literally, the word is, "Let the peace of God be the umpire. Let them call the strikes and balls." And there's sometimes that the peace of God is going to go, man, wrong door. <laughs> Don't go through that one. And so you let that. That's just four real simple things about the will of God. Four simple things about prayer. Four stuff. Aren't you glad your pastor just keeps it simple? Amen. Thank you, Pastor. All right, so that's all about prayer. He's telling you all about prayer. Okay, so 1 John 5, 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life. He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. So I can ask on behalf of someone that I'm in, a, in community with or in relationship with that I see is involved in something that's destructive to them. I can enter into prayer on their behalf and they can experience life in that death situation that they're in. Isn't that great? When you know a friend or somebody is just going the wrong direction, this ain't good, you know, you can walk up and say, you need to repent, sister. You need to repent, brother. I'm telling you right now. No, you can pray for them. You can pray for them. And God, look what he says. He says, if you pray for them, he will ask. That person will ask, and he, capital H, he, which means God, not you, but he, small he, when the small he asks, the big he will give life to that situation and turn it around. Isn't that great? That's good stuff right there. Now, for those who commit sin not leading to death, there is a sin leading to death. And I do not say that we should pray about that. I do not pray that we should pray about that. There is a sin leading to death. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Okay, let's take a look at this. You ready? So third thing is he wants you to know that you have responsibility to care for others. 
you have a responsibility to care for others. When we see someone in a difficult situation, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be interceding for one another. We need to be concerned about one another. We have a responsibility and a privilege of praying for people caught in bad situations. Communication that is not wrapped in redemptive prayer is only going to foster strife and more frustration. Some prayer meetings start like this. Bang, hello. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's terrible, eh? Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, I was heard that, you know, when da-da-da-da-da, really, oh, we should pray about this. We should. But then there was da-da-da-da. Oh, I know. I'm, yeah, I'm going to call so-and-so and talk about Hey, thanks very much. Bye-bye. No, prayer never even took place. All we did was talk about somebody's problem to somebody else. Sometimes we talk to somebody who doesn't even know about the problem, who's not even involved in the problem, who can't even have help in the problem because they're not even close to the situation, but we just spit a bunch of vomit over somebody else. And we call it all some kind of silly thing, like I was just concerned. Sometimes your concern that's not wrapped up in redemptive prayer doesn't actually bring any healing to a situation. It just digs the hole deeper. How many are feeling the blessing of the Lord right now? <laughs> That's fantastic. Come on, you should all be feeling it right now. Because you know what? The only thing we should be doing is praying redemptive prayers for each other and loving each other and being concerned for each other. Because you know where strife is and every work that causes division and fosters that? It says really clearly, well, where does that come from, Pastor? James said, it's of the devil. It's of the devil. That's what that is. But we should be praying for one another. We should be concerned about each other. But we shouldn't be having prayer gossip sessions. Can I get an amen from the back row? All right, back row. Terribly active today. All right. All right. There is a sin leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. If John knew what that meant, what he meant by that, I'm not sure. Is that good enough? That's not good enough? When John wrote that, I'm sure he knew what he was talking about. I'm not really sure. I have to tell you straight up, I'm not sure what that means. There's a sin leading to death, and it says that we don't need to be praying about. There's a sin leading to death. I, I don't know about you, but how many want to know what that is? There's a lot of scholars who talk about all kinds of things. I'm a little conflicted because in the context, is this actually a believer, a brother or sister that I'm praying for? If it's not a brother or sister that I'm praying for, then very simply I could say that it could be that I don't have to pray for people who refuse to embrace Jesus as their Savior. And if they don't want to do that and they refuse adamantly to ever acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, there's nothing I can do about that. Because you got to accept that. I mean, God himself is breathing, believing faith on them and that, and they're completely reluctant to do anything about it. That could be, because I know that sin of rejecting Jesus as your Savior, that will absolutely lead to not just death, but spiritual death forever and ever. So that could be one interpretation. But we did communion today, and communion today, that's a believer thing. And it says, for this reason, many are weak and many are sick among you, and many sleep. That sleep means dead. And I don't know, maybe there's something that happens in community and stuff like that. For this reason, many are What was the reason? How many know what the reason was? The reason was you didn't discern the body. There's a place in, in Titus where it said, warn a divisive person once, warn them twice, warn them the third time, have nothing to do with them. I don't know. I'm just throwing a few things out at you. I, like I said at the start, John knew exactly what he meant when he wrote that. I don't. And there's a whole bunch of people that give you all kinds of reasons that I've just given you a couple, and that could be it, might be it, but let me just wrap it up like this. We need to be praying for each other, especially when a brother or sister falls into a bad situation. If we pray, God's life will enter into that situation and he'll lift them up. So we want you to know that you need to pray, and you need to pray and care for one another. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to move on before I get in any more trouble. All right? 1 John 5, 18 and 19, we know. Say, we know. We know a lot of stuff, and John wants you to know. We know whoever is born of God does not sin. Hello? Don't sin. Don't do it. Our sin's not so bad. God forgives us. Don't forget, Pastor, we're a grace church. Titus says, grace teaches us to say, no to ungodliness and worldliness. It teaches us to say yes to God and live upright lives. So if we're a grace church, we should especially be manifesting that sin isn't what marks us as a people. We're really pretty amazing. It says we're not slaves to sin anymore, but we are slaves to righteousness. Say righteousness. And you know what? Only apply that scale to yourself. 
You guys could all be a little more righteous. I just want to tell you. You know what? Holiness and all those things are often very personal. And sometimes we apply holiness to all the wrong stupid things. You know, I know some people think they're holy because they don't do some stuff. There's some stuff I just don't do because I'm holy. But the fact that you just told me that shows me that you got pride, which is probably the worst thing ever. There's a lot of people who step into spiritual sins when they're trying to get rid of the outer sins. And they think, if I just keep the outer side of the cup looking real good to everybody else, I'm real good. But the inside of the cup stinks. And that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees, whose righteousness was amazing. He says, you guys are tombs of death. Looks good on the outside, but there's death on the inside. That's why they got so mad at him. You have no idea how hard I've been working at looking so holy. And he said, there's death inside you. Are you kidding me? So don't try to play Holy Spirit with each other. And, you know. Okay, that was good. Three people got that. All right. Do not sin. And he who is born of God keeps himself. Say keeps himself. Keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. You know, for this reason, the Son of God came in 1 John. He came to destroy the works of the evil one. Destroy it. Destroy the works of heaven. So you know what? When we are in God and you're in Christ and you're born of God, the enemy cannot touch you. The only way he can touch you is if he lies to you and thinks he can touch you and then you'll believe him and, you know, embrace something stupid that doesn't belong to you. And the whole world, it lies under the sway of the wicked one, but folks, we're not of the world. All right, so what do we got right here? We got number four is no, your righteousness is secure. Your righteousness is secure. Not a better version of you and not a moral self-improvement of you. Not a better, you know, come to church and we're going to teach you how to have a better version of you. How many want to see the better Carl, amen? Just keep coming back Sunday after Sunday and we will teach you how to be the better you. All right, we're going to teach you how to overcome stress, how to overcome fear. We're going to teach you how to do all these things. Next week, we got Stress Buster 101. Oh, I want to learn how to get rid of stress. Okay, here's what you do. You got to sleep right. You got to eat right. You got to dance right. You got to hang out with those who do. And then we got all these things you got to do to get rid of stress. You know how you get rid of stress? Get whacked in the Holy Ghost. It's a one-step program. Get whacked in God and know that you're whacked in God and stay whacked in God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. A brand new you. Guess what? You're not trying to get a better you. There is a brand new you. When you are born of God, you're a brand new creation. His divine nature, a nature that's focused on righteousness is in you. The righteousness you could have never done on your own. And you can't do it on your own. You can't save yourself and you can't make yourself holy. He justified you. He sanctified you. And he has already glorified you. Done. Finished. Over. It's all finished. you got to know that your righteousness is absolutely... That's why it's the breastplate of righteousness. If you don't think you're righteous, the enemy will attack you. And right on your main organs, on that area, your heart, which is all the issues of life come from your heart, if you're not secure that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, you'll constantly come under attack. But you need to know that your righteousness is secure. Can I get a hallelujah? All right. Okay, you can change because he changed who you are. So you can change what you do because he changed who you are. Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All right, I got a quote from Joanne. I don't think Joanne and Ramey are here today, but Wednesday night, if you weren't here, Paul and Joanne shared their stories. All somewhere along, the stories were amazing. But you know, Joanne shared an incredible story of transformation in her life. And you know, Joanne, this is a quote from Joanne. Jesus changed everything. Jesus changed everything. Everything. So I got two questions for you, all right? When you came to Jesus, what changed? I want you to answer that. I want you don't have to yell it out or shout it out, but I want you inside you. Because when Joanne talked to us on Wednesday night, she said when Jesus came into her life, everything changed. And she had a testimony. She was sharing things because when God came in, everything in her world completely shifted. Let me ask you a question. When you came to Jesus, what changed? I'm not asking you that as a test to see if you're in. I'm just asking you because you know what? When Jesus comes in, everything changes. Here's the fact. When Jesus comes in, everything is made new. And when you came to Jesus, you have to be able to answer that question, what changed? And Paul, or John is trying to share with passion with every person that you know what? Coming to Jesus changes everything in your life. And I want you to know that. You don't have to be the same. You don't have to live the same. You don't have to be under the same yoke of oppression. When you come to Jesus, everything changes. Let me ask you the question again. When you came to Jesus, what changed? 
please, you have to be able to answer that. You should be able to say the big, big everything, and then you should be able to point out very specifics in your life that I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that he's in my life. I know that he's my Savior, and I know that he changed everything. He didn't just get a ticket to heaven someday. Everything right now completely, radically shifts in your world. And you are living, walking, abiding, tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. The life of God took up residence in you and everything has changed. And John wants you to know that. Let me ask you another question. How is the Holy Spirit leading you right now? How is the Holy Spirit leading you right now. You see, when when you're a child of God and and when you know that he's given you and secured you in him and in his righteousness, you should be able to answer those questions with real clarity. Not to prove you're a believer, but because you're a believer. Don't get so quiet on me. All right, let's let's move on. I got to move on. Oh, I got to move on. Oh my God. All right, so uh, 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come to give us an understanding. Say understanding. We know, see, we know this, we know this. We know that the Son of God has come to give us an understanding that we may know him who is true and that we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. That is true, the true God and eternal life. Isn't that a good verse? I mean, oh my goodness, I want you to know that the Son of God has come and he's given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and that we may know that we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the true and eternal life. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic stuff. I want you to know, what's he want you to know? He wants you to know that you're fixed in truth. You're fixed in Jesus who is truth. You're firmly established in Jesus and he is truth. Your understanding of his abiding relationship will continue to grow. You are secure in your ever-expanding relationship with him. Can I get an amen? 1 John 5, 21. All right, we're moving on now. 1 John 5, 21. Little children, this is it. This is the very last verse in the whole book. We went all through the summer to get to the last verse, and everybody saves the best for last, right? If you want to leave my last word, the final thing I'm going to say before I say amen and goodbye, here it is. Here's the most important thing. I'm going to drop it on you right now. You ready? Little children, don't forget your little children. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Bam. Attention grabbing climax. The final word, the mic drop. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Pray that they don't touch you. No, keep yourself from them. Ah, uh, can I meddle a little bit for two minutes? Thank you for that. No, amen. amen. All right, so what do you got? Last one, you got to know your responsibility. You got to know your responsibility. You have the lead role in determining your realities. You have the lead role in determining your realities. God will not force himself on you. In a culture of victimization and blame, you need to take responsibility. There's a lot of people living way below their privileges because they're embracing the culture of our day. And the culture of our day is highly polarized and people are picking stupid sides to everything and they're missing everything that's going on because they're allowing themselves to get victimized and sucked into the blame situation. And some people have got into a place where they've idolized something until it let them down and then they demonize it. So you go all the way from idolization to demonization. That's because you should have never idolized anything except having God as first place in your life anyways. Thank you, pastor. This is so good. So good. Matthew 4.10, then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Worship, what is worship? It's service. Worship is what you serve. What are you serving? Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creation or the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Worship is service. And you see, when people begin to serve something other than God, they have actually exchanged God for some other thing and that is idolatry. Can I get an amen? Amen. I thought idolatry was in India where they pour fruits and vegetables on those little little statues. No, idolatry is big time here. When I go to India, the people over there in India and Africa, they say, thank God I don't live in North America where there's so much idolatry. I say, we don't have idolatry. Are you kidding? We worship self. We've exalted self. We've exalted all kinds of things way bigger than God is. 
I don't have an idol. You do. You have a big black square box right in your living room. You stare at it all day long. Ouch, did that ever hurt? Seven hours of college football yesterday. Whoa! Idolatry. Idolatry is worship misdirected. Something or someone that fills your heart other than God. Idols promise things that only God can deliver. When you put God first, you will not get disappointed. There's a lot of idolatry. And this, is, this is mic drop, bang, here's the climax. Folks, it says, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. That's God. He, he justifies and sanctifies. But then it says, who does not lift up their soul to an idol? What, what are you talking about? It means that, you know what? I'm more excited about you finishing the sermon so I can go watch NASCAR than I am listen to you anymore today. I'm sitting here right now and my soul is screaming, would you shut up? I want to get out of this building. This morning when I wanted to come to church, suddenly I didn't want to come to church. All these other things pressed into my life and all these other thoughts came in. I said, I could be doing this and I could be doing that and I could be doing that. You've lifted up your soul to vanity. Something else has got more exciting in your life than God. Something else is way more important to you than God. Some person, some thing, some object, a child, a parent, a loved one, a, a, a media star, something. You've set something else in your life up as more important to you than seeking God. You idolatrous people. <laughs> Man, and this was such a good summer to this point. We were having so much fun enjoying John. But bam, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Ouch, pastor. I've actually got more, so hang on. All right. Am I free from idolatry? Let's ask ourselves. You ready? Who or what do you love most? What do you fear? What do you fear? What do you fear? Fill in the blank. What do you fear? Well, I fear I might get sick. What do you fear? I fear, you know, my friend might leave me. What do you fear? See, what you fear, you serve. What you fear, you worship. And see, God wants you to fear him, not because he's terrible, but because he's awesome. And he's wonderful. But, you know, if you let fear creep into your life, you'll become a servant of what you fear. What do you fear right now? I'm telling you. If you fear something, God's not first in your life. Wow, is this meddling just a little? Is it? No? Okay, then let's go on. Who's your functional savior? Now, I had a sister-in-law once who I said, what's your salvation all about? And she said to me, oh, you know, I, I let, uh, oh, thank you. I was looking that bad. You know? <laughs> it's bad when you can't even listen anymore because you're just like, he's a human sprinkler. I can't take it anymore. You know? But who's your functional savior? I had a sister-in-law who I said, what's your salvation all about? She said, oh, John takes care of that stuff. Like she says, John takes care of the, he takes care of the spiritual things in your life. Said, John can't take care of the spiritual things in your life. Sadly, a few years later, they were divorced. But you can't have something else as a functional savior in your life. What do you sacrifice for or give your time to? I'm going to start preaching next week about Imagine, and it's a series we're going to do for a couple of weeks called I'm In, and I'm actually going to, as a pastor, I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to get weird or creepy, maybe a little bit, but I'm going to ask you, could you help us with Saturdays and Sundays? Could you, for a season, and I know there's a lot going on, but instead of having a lot going on somewhere else, could we squeeze a little more time out of you? Could we? And I am going to ask for that. And I think it's worth it. And if you can't, I totally get it. But I'm asking those that can and that are willing to and you got the space in your life to do it, please help us during the season. Because we want to start two services. We're going to spend money on billboards. We got mailing going out, 18,000 flyers, another 30,000 inserts. We got stuff going all over the place. And I don't want to throw all that out and then invite people to a room full of 10 people. So I'm hoping that you'll all give us a hand, right? But listen, what do you give your time to? Oh, I would, you know, but I got my Ramoli group that night, you know. Ramoli is awesome. I mean, if you know how many played Ramoli? It's a pretty awesome game. You know, and I got my bowling club, and that's the night that I watch seven hours of college football. PVR it, you know. The Leafs are going to be on soon on Saturday night. And, you know, and that's the night that me and my wife have our special time together. I work so hard all week, I, have, I hardly have time for anything. I want to hang out with my family. <laughs> 
Anyways, I don't know if that was rude or not, but anyway, what do you sacrifice for? Sacrifice, are you asking for sacrifice, Pastor? Oh my God, I thought we were a grace church. Because we're a grace church, we want everybody else to experience the grace of God. And that's gonna take a little bit of effort. And so we're gonna do it. So what do you pursue for peace at all cost? What do you pursue for, where, I mean, where do you pull back to when you need peace for all costs? What do you do? I'm just asking you some of those questions just to, just to plunge into my heart and your heart, just a few things to say, is there any? Because, you know, John said, little children, keep yourself from idols. All right, I'm done. Look at this. <laughs> so amazing. This was Augustine of Hippo, and Augustine of Hippo, it's in the context of a bunch of other stuff, but he really did mean it. He said, love God and do as you please. Love God and do as you please. I like Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, love God and sin boldly. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But what he means is love God, and if you sin, just be open about it. Don't hide it. Just live out in the open all the time. Love God, and trust me, I'm telling you, your life is gonna move. If you love God, if you worship Jesus, if you worship Jesus, and if you push hard on the spiritual component of your life, and if you abide and just draw deeply from the wells of salvation, you're gonna experience everything else in your world is gonna fall in line. And it's all gonna be good. If you'll put Jesus first, if you'll keep yourself from idols, Keep yourself. Don't make the pastor preach sermons about it. Thank God my pastor keeps, I'm not gonna keep you. Keep yourself from idolatry. Keep yourself from it, all right? Wow, that was a hardcore nasty way to finish a good sermon series. But you know what, looking like a believer, it, it does look like something. You know, whatever is on the inside, it should start to manifest, you know? That little kid in Sunday school said, if I got Jesus on the inside of me, he's really big, right? He's really big. Well, shouldn't he show through? Shouldn't he show through? Shouldn't he? The Apostle John, again, they'd bring him into the room. They carried him in in his old age, and he'd walk through, and he'd say, little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. You know, that's really the big deal. One commandment, love each other as he has loved you. You know, there's a whole world out there that is so polarized and so messed up. I think the greatest miracle is going to be a diverse church, diverse in age, background, ethnicity, a diverse church walking together in unconditional love is going to save this world. Because the polarization is going to get deeper, creepier, and stranger. And don't get involved in it. Because the world is looking for some place where there's freedom, there's hope, and there's unconditional acceptance and love. And it's true. Come on, stand up. Pasta. My goodness, Pastor. All right, you ready? Can you bow your heads, close your eyes? Just want you to pray. Everybody's praying. Everybody's praying. Now listen, if you're here today and, and there's an invitation to you to be a part of the family of God, and it's really a simple invitation. It's really just believe. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe that He is who He said He is, the Savior of the world. He is the one who forgives the sins of all mankind. And you just got to say, you know what, I accept that. I accept that Jesus is not just the Savior, but I want him to be my Savior. I want to just pull out everything else and say, thank you, Jesus. Be my Lord and my Savior. Listen, that's you today. You've never done that before. You've never said, hey, Jesus, I accept you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. If you've never done that, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to put up your hand. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you to put up your hand really high. You ready? Here it is. One, two, three. There goes your hand. Anyone, all around. Anybody right now? You can still do it right now. Right now. All right. Well, on this Labor Day, it looks like everybody's made sound choices. It's good stuff. Hope it didn't scare you into keeping your hand down. How many are a little bit scared of the preacher today? Just a little. All eyes closed, heads bowed. You know that. <laughs> Let me pray for you, all right? Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You know, we're going to celebrate Labor Day tomorrow, and I thank you that you did all the labor. I thank you that the work is done. I thank you that you did the work completely and said, it is finished. And thank you that you've done everything necessary for me to have a beautiful relationship with my Heavenly Father. We just thank you that we can be this community here. And Lord, we just want to embrace all that you are. My, my only passion, my only heart is that, that this beautiful community can, can multiply and express your kindness and that people experience acceptance and grace and your goodness. 
And so, Father, as we enter into this new season, into September, and a lot of transition, a lot of change, we tug deeply on your grace. Lord, we're doing this for one reason, because we believe you spoke to us to do it. We believe that you told us to do this. And so, Father, we thank you that what you tell us to do is blessed with your power to achieve. But Father, I just pray as we go through it that, Lord, you will minister grace to us. You will refresh us. That we're not going to do this. I love what Jesus said. Jesus said, my meat and my drink is to do the will of my Father. And so, Father, let it be our meat and drink. And let us feel satisfied. Let us be refreshed as we enter into this season where I think we're going to see incredible harvest and breakthrough. And Father, I also pray tomorrow we're going to have an amazing picnic. And Lord, we command the rain to stay away. And it can come at about 5. That would be awesome. Or 4.30 even. Maybe 4.32. But Lord, we just ask for a a day where we can have fun and watch Pastor Cheryl get thrown off the bucking bronco. That would be so good. So Lord, we're just asking you to uh, just present us with a day that we can have fun and that we can out in public manifest loving community and demonstrate some picnic theology. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you for the privilege of serving them as a pastor. And I pray, Lord, that you'd honor them today and bless them with your word, the richness of your life. And I pray right now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost that they go forward to manifest your kingdom and your purpose in Jesus' precious name. Amen.